a little bit of a minute to proclaim and praise the Lord. And so uh, that's good. You're all warmed up. And so now it's uh, time to really have some, some worship around hearing. Sometimes we're dull of hearing. Sometimes we're just uh, a little too noisy. And sometimes we uh, get caught up in conversation that's really almost meaningless, vanity and vexation of spirit. And so we're led this year to uh, have a neat little theme about uh, what we talk about. What are we talking about? What are we spending our time in conversation with other people about? How do we talk to our brothers in the Lord? How do we talk to our spouses? How do we talk to our friends? What, beyond how, what are we talking about? And so as God compelled me this year to kind of go in this direction and, and over the last few months, some studies and just some quiet time with the Lord, I thought this is a, a really neat place to go with our men. Uh, if we're to lead well and be better in how we lead and, and really be in a place where we are walking with a healthier walk, then one of the pieces and parts is what we talk about, what we spend time and chatter about. And I wonder with all the things that may come out today from the Word and for tomorrow in the Word and the Spirit of God, how we respond. So that's some of that time that you took already. What were you talking about in your prayer? What were you doing as we spent four minutes in prayer? Just four minutes in prayer. What are we talking about with God? These things are funny sometimes. They spend an awful lot of time on a lot of idle things that mean absolutely nothing. So, truly, I, I pray that God will do that which uh, He desires to do, and you will give Him permission over the next uh, less than 24 hours to really speak in to your heart. I'll use one last illustration and introduce our guy that's going to be speaking to us. I already, of course, uh, before we got with a meal, spoke of him, but a little bit more. You just had, uh, there's about 60 to 70 of you here. You just had a meal. Sat around and talked. What did we talk about? Did we talk about ourselves? Did we talk about the other person at the table? Did we talk about Jesus? Do we talk about the things of God? That's where we're going. That's where I'd like to go. With us really checking out in our minds what we're thinking about. And maybe it would be good if we learned from the Lord what he would like to talk about to us and what he would like to have us talk about. I knew that uh, there was, uh, of course, Roe has been here with us in many, many men's conferences as a preacher. Uh, as a mentor, a model, and all of the things that go with a deep friend in the Lord Jesus Christ and a brother. He is a friend of mine in so many ways. Bobby introduced me to this, uh, this man many a year ago, and he is man. I, you know I've mentioned him more than once, how much he means to me. His wisdom, his direction, his mentorship, his oversight. Uh, I can point to times in my life where Roe is used by God to really, really get me back on track with the man that I need to be and actually even pieces and parts of what I would talk about in my conversation even with him. So he's very important to me, of course. He's important to you, important to the Lord Jesus Christ, most of all, his wife and, and children, grandchild, and, and all that goes in that package. And so uh, I'm thankful that a friend of our church, I think that he actually is, by proxy, one of the members of First Bible Baptist Church. Please welcome Pastor Roe Porter, Savannah Baptist Temple. Give me a little bit of love. That's enough love. Okay, I'll, I'll behave. My, I'll, I'll go hey guys, on. it is great to be back. As uh, the pastor just says, Brownie, I, I've got a special place in my heart uh, for you. Uh, 
Last year, we, we were fed. I mean, it was cold, but chap fed us the word of God. And what I love about this church is you love Jesus. And you love the word of God. And that's kind of how I pick people in my life. If you love Jesus, uh, we can spend some time together. If you love the Word of God, we can spend some time together. And if you love others, we can spend some time together. Now, uh, I love you, Pastor. I thank God for him. He has been very special in my life also. Uh, my Facebook pastor is here tonight. Where, 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 where's, where's Bubby Bonner at, man? Oh, there you are. You're over, normally over here. You moved on me, man. It's good to see my Facebook pastor face to face. You'll get that later. Many years ago, uh, Bobby, we had supported Bobby uh, when he was in Zambia, and he cast this vision for our church to have a baseball clinic. I thought to myself, what do you know about baseball? And he said, no, he said, I'm going to get this guy, Mark Brown. He said, Brownie, he'll come in, he'll do the clinic, and I'll help, and, you know, I'll do whatever... Uh, he tells me to do, and it'll be great. You'll get your people involved. So we did it three years in a row. I, I, you know, I, I went through some notes the other day because I want to make sure I did this. We had over 100 professions of faith, Bobby. Amen. We passed out hundreds and hundreds of Bibles. We got the local Gideons to give us Bibles. We passed those out. We had local business people. Uh, help us with our t-shirts we gave hundreds and hundreds of t-shirts out we gave I think 60 baseball gloves to inner city kids and just had a wonderful time and it was so neat uh, Mark was out there showing them how to throw the ball and I said here's this wore out <laughs> professional <laughs> out of shape ex uh, baseball pitcher showing these little kids little, little bitty kids how to throw the ball and our people were standing alongside of them and just having a great time. And then Bonnie was showing them how to pick the ball, how to field the ball. We didn't have anybody do hitting because we didn't have anybody in the clinic that knew anything about hitting, Bonner. Uh, Y'all may not know what the Mendoza line is. I'll just leave that, okay? So... Uh, uh, now, let's. Before midnight tonight, there'll be a baseball card posted on uh, Facebook that will show a batting average above 200. <laughs> and Bobby Bonner's name will be next to it. Amen. <laughs> We're just having fun. Now, <laughs> bad preacher. Bad, bad, bad. Hey, listen, uh, a couple months ago, uh, Brownie called me and tasked me to speak at this conference and gave me this crazy subject. I said, man, I'm the last guy that needs to talk about what we're talking about. And I put this thing to prayer, guys. I, I mean, I, I take what I do very seriously. I did not want to come here and give you something superficial. Well, we need to only say good things. Don't say bad things, how to talk to you. I, I didn't want to do that. And God began to lay some things on my heart, and he drew my attention to the text of this conference. And what I'm going to do tonight is talk about God's call on your life. We've all been called. And we're going to talk about that. Then tomorrow morning, we're going to go to James chapter 3 and talk about what are you talking about, God's wisdom. Are you speaking from the wisdom of God in your life? Is the wisdom of God saturating your heart that what you say, what you do is a byproduct of the, of the wisdom that resides within your heart. And then Sunday morning, <clears throat> we're going to talk about what are you talking about? Truth. That we ought to be carrying truth in every conversation, every encounter. We ought to be practitioners and proclaimers of the truth. 
So I've already told you where we're going. I, I could sit down now. We're all done, but uh, we got to do that other stuff called teaching. Okay, take your Bibles and turn with me tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse uh, number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with the ecstasy of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. Now this is Apostle Paul saying this. He wanted them to know that they needed to stand in the power of God. That is the heart of your pastor, and that is my heart this week. That when we're finished with the next day and a half, we will leave this place knowing that we've experienced the power of God in our heart. Father, I thank you so much for your goodness and for you bringing us here. Lord, what beautiful worship tonight. Lord, I thought about what you've laid on my heart and what we sung about. Lord, I, you always do that stuff. Lord, I am highly motivated by your spirit tonight to share your word. And God, I thank you for that Holy Spirit. I just pray for your anointing. I pray that we'd all be humble and be teachable tonight as you do what you'll do through the Spirit. Teach us, O oh God. Holy Spirit, convict us. Make us soft, Holy Spirit. Let us receive from you, O oh God, what you have for us. And Lord, may the very thing that we need to rebuke be rebuked in our life that we can hear from you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Now, the Apostle Paul, I just want to mention a couple of things about him as we get started, because he's our example here. The Apostle Paul was chosen by God to become a servant of the Lord. Just like you, just like myself, we are all chosen. We're going to talk about that in a few moments. Paul was given a message to deliver. He was given something to say. Paul delivered that message faithfully. And then the message that Paul delivered had eternal significance. We have the opportunity in our life to do that which has eternal significance. And what you say really, really matters. The ministry at Corinth that Paul started there, he started a church, he spent 18 months there with Aquila and Priscilla. They started a church and uh, someone has said that the city and the people of Corinth were, were fast, they were gaudy, they were commercial, they were brassy, they were loud, they were shadowed. Uh, shallow, they were slick, plastic, busy, sensual, intelligent, humanistic, self-serving. However, it was there that God sent Paul and he planted a church. It was there that later Apollos came and watered that church and God gave the increase. So the gospel in Christ works any and everywhere. And we live in such a day and such an hour that we think the gospel is a little old-fashioned. The gospel still has the power of God unto salvation. And at the essence, God sent Paul to Corinth 
to say something. And praise God, Paul was faithful to say it. It says in Acts chapter 18, verse 4, talk, talking about that first visit to Corinth, it says, And he, Paul, reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. God has laid it upon your pastor's heart to slow you down a little bit, to get you to examine what is in your heart because what is in your heart is reflected by what you say and what you talk about i have been tasked this uh this weekend to to deal with that so as i said i know you're well equipped to go a little deeper than maybe uh you thought this conference was going to be okay but I got confidence in you. If you'll just come along, we'll, we'll enjoy ourselves. I promise you that. Because we're going to get right in the book. Paul, what, what he does in this letter, and, and, and it's really unique, that he was writing to a church that he found out that they, they got a little sideways. They, uh, they were, their doctrine was beginning to go in the wrong direction. Their behavior was lacking. Their, their morals begin to decay. And Paul wrote to them this letter. And what Paul does in the first two chapters is, is tremendous. Because what he does, he begins to say, guys, we're in this thing together. And the first thing he does, he says, I want you, as I write to you, to remember your call. That we're called. And that's the first thing I want to say to you tonight. Remember your call. Now, the theme of our, our conference is in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1 is in the middle of a paragraph. So if you mind, I'm, I'm going to go into 1 if you don't mind. And this is where that paragraph starts. He says here in uh, verse number 26, I love this. For ye know ye see your calling, or you know your calling. Brethren, how not many wise men at the flesh. You know your calling, not many wise have been called. Let that kind of sink in a minute. He says, not many mighty not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame, to confound the wise. And has chosen the weak things of the world to shame, to confound the things which are mighty. That is powerful stuff. What, what, what Paul begins, he, he wants them to understand that, hey, listen, guys, this is not you. It's God that does the work. I don't want to lay this on you tonight. Most of us out there are not smart. We're not intellects, guys. We're not really powerful either. It, Nobody is of noble birth in here. And most of us, other than myself, you don't look that good either. But, but God wasn't looking for good people. He wasn't looking for smart people. He was looking for his people. And for us to understand what God is trying to do, God wants to build his church not my church not my design not my I'm not picking the team God is thank God some of us however it doesn't say all but some but we, there's a few of us that are wise maybe there's a few of us that may be powerful 
But most of us, as it says in 28, what God has done, the base things of the world, the things which are despised, that's us, has God chosen. Five times here in these three verses, he uses the word called and chosen. It is God who adds to his church. Are you with me? Yea, the things which are not to bring to not the things which are. God is doing something and, and picking us misfits, putting us together in his wisdom, his design. We are called to be what God wants us to be. Isn't that good? It is God's perfect knowledge. It's God's wisdom. He finds us. We don't find him. Man, back many, 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 many moons ago at 2805 West 7th Street, Jacksonville, Florida, Saturday morning, a bus worker knocked on our door at 2805 West 7th Street. Leonard Abbott, he's in heaven. You got any children in there want to ride the bus to church? I said to myself, I'm not riding a bus to church. My mom said, yeah, we do. What time? We'll be by to get them tomorrow, uh, quarter till 10. Have them dressed. Well, she wanted my sister to go. My sister wanted to go. I didn't want to go, but I had to go because of my sister. Listen, God found me through a guy named Leonard Abbott, a bricklayer. I wasn't noble. <laughs> I sure wasn't wise. He found me. Amen. Are you there? It is not by human design. It is by the truth and the spirit. Now, now, why does God do this? Let's look at the reason. Look at the reason. Verse number 29, look at it. That no flesh should glory in his presence. You want to know what God is trying to do? He's trying to build an assembly. That's that Greek word for the church. It's ecclesia, a called out group. That when people see it, they see God. When they hear us talk, they hear God. When, when, when they listen to us sing, they see God. Because we have nothing to offer than what God has given to us. Amen. Amen. We are designed to give him glory and praise. In God's economy and in his church, there's no room for self-worship and self-glory. It's all about him. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is found over in Colossians 1.18. Boy, that's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> and he is the head of of the body, the church, the ecclesia, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead. He created this thing that in all things he might have the preeminence, the most important place in the church is Jesus Christ. Amen? So what are the results when Jesus gets the glory, when, when we understand what's going on, what are the results? Man, this is good. Look at these two verses here. He says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Colossians 2, 3 says that are ye in Christ Jesus? You need to understand this. In whom are hidden all the treasures and wisdom and knowledge of God. What are the results? Here they are. I have wisdom given to me because I'm in Christ. I have the wisdom of how you get from this life to the next life. 
I have the wisdom that God came to us. We do not go to him. He came to save us. You have that knowledge. You've been called to that knowledge. That knowledge has been given to you. Look at the second thing, righteousness. God has placed in you through Christ the righteousness of the Son of God. You are made right with God, declared right, and that will never change. You are right with God because Christ placed it in you. He called that to happen. Man. Sanctification. I can't be like Christ without Christ. I can't be holy unless he set me apart to be holy. There, there's nothing I can accomplish Outside of the fact that I'm in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, I've been called. Amen. That's God's wisdom to us. Then, then that final thing he gives to us is redemption. That I am his purchased possession. When he looks at us, church, when he looks at us, guys, he bought us. And he wasn't looking for special people. He wasn't looking for smart people. He wasn't looking for good-looking people. He was looking for men who would trust him and give him honor and give him glory. He wasn't looking for superstars. Looking for people that he could redeem and place in a position that, that, that we would be trophies of his grace, that we would raise our hearts toward heaven and praise his holy name. That's what he's called us to. The scriptural and spiritual principle is given to us in verse 31. Here's the principle. If we glory, there's only one place the glory belongs. It's not in man. It's not in the pastor. It's not in the music team. It's in him. And if all of us remember that's our call, he will always receive the honor and the glory. Now, the third thing that the Paul does, he gives us his example. His example is found over in uh, the second chapter. He says, hey, do you remember how, how I came to you? He says, and, and, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellence of speech and of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, but I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus and him crucified. Paul says, I didn't come to be sensational when I came to you. I didn't come in a secular manner. I, I didn't come with philosophy. I came in the Spirit. That's what we're called to be, in the Spirit. Paul refused to pollute the message of Christ with any human wisdom or effort. He had a single focus, and the single focus was that I came and I was determined, I predetermined, I, I, I wrote it down, I, edged, I, I made the decision before I even got there. I've got one thing to say. Jesus was crucified for you. Now, let's look at that, that message was Jesus and him crucified. Now, when you, when you consider that, what he determined, he said, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus and him crucified. I was riding in, in, in my pickup truck, and every man ought to have a pickup truck, man. It's a great thing. Especially when you live down south, it's a requirement. Real men drive trucks. Amen. A revival has broken out here. Okay. <laughs> I knew that would happen. Paul never, never got over his gospel experience. I was riding down the road, man, man just thinking about it how Paul had one thing he wanted to say. Jesus died for sinners. 
And, and if you follow his life, he never got over the gospel experience that, that he was in bondage and he was set free. That, that, that he was rescued from his religion, rescued from tradition, rescued from himself. Jesus found Paul. He never got over the experience that changed his life. He was sold on the message of the gospel. He shares that two different times outside of what's recorded in the book of Acts, the actual account. He's before the Jewish council. And he says, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you my story, which is a Jesus story. You want to know what you ought to be talking about, guys? The, your story, which ought to be a Jesus story. Always looking for opportunities to talk about. And something else about the Apostle Paul. He, he, he spoke it before King Agrippa. Man, he wasn't intimidated. He wasn't intimidated by the audience because he knew the gospel changed his life. I'm telling you, the gospel changed my life. The gospel works because it worked on me. Amen? Something else, Paul never minimized the gospel message. He didn't minimize it. He didn't back away from it. One of my favorite portions of the scripture is Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Uh, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul says also in 1 Corinthians 9.16, it's one of my favorite they're all, they're all my favorite. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Paul says, I might as well be taken out. I have something to say. I want to talk about Jesus. I want to tell you my story. It's about Jesus. Let me tell you what he did for me. He can do the same thing for you. When he wrote the book of Galatians and he was talking about traditions, he closes out that book with this great statement. But God forbid that I should glory or boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world is crucified or dead unto me, and I am worthless to the world. I, it's all about Jesus. Now, let's look at the next thing, verse 3, Paul's method. Paul's method, and, and this is what it looks like to live out your call. And I was with you, in weakness, in fear, in much trembling. He said, what, what's that about? Because Paul was humbled at the fact that he'd been given the honor to carry the treasure of the gospel and to tell others about Jesus Christ. He goes on and says, in my speech... And my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. It, it, it wasn't all wrapped up in, in philosophy of men. It was pure. It was the simple story of Jesus. And then, then he makes this statement, but in the demonstration of the spirit of power. He was humbled before God, before his call and before others. His words were not crafted in human wisdom and skillful speech it was in the simple presentation the simple words of the gospel his method look what it says at the very end of verse 4 but in the demonstration of the spirit and that word spirit is capitalized means holy spirit and of power that's the same word that's used over in romans 1 16 it's the greek word dunamis the miraculous explosive power of God 
I preached the gospel and it was filled with the power of God and God changed lives. Wow. Well, what was Paul's motive? Look at verse 5. This is good. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What Paul was trying to do is do that which was eternal. To build a faith that would stand the test. A conviction, a trust that would be built up, that would be strengthened, that, that those who he preached to, those he talked to, those who he was called to minister to, that in their life they would have a gospel experience and they would never minimize what they had heard. That they would have conviction about what they believed in. Nobody can convince me that God did not change my heart and my life. By not only the faith in that experience, because it changed me. That's the proof. But also what I have grown to know in Christ through the gospel itself. And he kind of does a contrast here. And anytime you see a contrast in Scripture, it's a wonderful time to slow down. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And the wisdom of men, the words of men, the philosophy of men, you'll never be able to stand. Christ gives a beautiful illustration, the Sermon on the Mount. The illustration of the two houses. One built upon the sand that does not last. But one that is built upon the rock. The winds, the storms come. That's, that's the example of what Paul's talking about here. He, our job, our calling, is to look into our heart and to recognize the fact that we've been called. Let's, let's kind of slow down for a minute here. Let's, let's see what the Spirit has taught us here. Let's, let's look at some application points here. I just want to slow down for a moment. What have we learned? Remember the transforming power of the gospel in its message of hope. That's what you've been given. Amen? If you've been saved, you've been given the hope of the gospel. Amen? Number two, we need to refuse to seek human praise and glory. Our, our job is not to get the glory. Nobody really cares what you've got to say. Ever been telling a story and you recognize nobody's listening? The story we need to be talking about is his story, amen? And then number three, or bullet point three, put your trust in the power of God, not in the wisdom of man. Our words and our actions should be confirming the message of Christ that we have encountered him and now we're called to share him, amen? Amen? I know that you know him because you're going to be talking about him. Amen? I know that you know him because you're going to be communicating him to me and to others. You know, it was about a year from 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 Corinthians. I, I mean, we've... We've looked at some of it, and man, it was powerful. And uh, you want to know a large portion of that church at Corinth didn't receive it. They got mad. They got mad of being reminded of these things. They got mad of some of the, the things Paul had to say, and they questioned Paul's call. They, they even got personal with Paul. They said, Paul, listen, you can't even preach good. Your speech is contemptible, Paul. Some even got really personal. You're not much to look at. Who are you to tell us about this call and to tell us these things about Jesus? 
You would think. Paul would move on. But you know what Paul did? Paul wrote a second letter. And this is one of these spirit things that God does to you when you're preparing a sermon. Because I thought doing this. I want to stop right here. But God has laid this part on my heart. So I want to drive a point home because I think that's what Paul was trying to do. Paul wrote to them again. Second Corinthians is the most autobiographical book that Paul writes. Paul opens up his heart and talks about the ministry. You, you, you never see Paul angry, but Paul is straightforward. He's bold, but what he does in St. Corinthians, he becomes laser focused on what he had already told them about the call. And there's some verses in 2 Corinthians that jump out of the page at you that reminds you we have been called of God to say something and to do something. So, so what I want to do is, is drive home what the Spirit gave me. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 5 through 7. We, we, we just kind of drop in here because Paul's already laid out how important he believes handling the Word of God is in his ministry and, and he's going through suffering. Then he begins to say some very powerful things about his call. And if you've been listening at all, you'll recognize the essence is still the same. For we preach... And he uses the word we. He assumed that every believer had been called to tell the story of Jesus. It says, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, your servants for Christ's sake. Look what he says in verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined where? In your hearts to be given the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He says, you have been given God through the Holy Spirit. You have Jesus in you through the Holy Spirit. You have the knowledge of God. Look what he drives home, verse 7. This is so powerful. But we... Paul says, I've got it. You have it. Guys, you have it. We have the treasure in earthen vessels. Clay pots. What is in clay pots? All of what he's previously said, that, that, that the light of God came into our heart and told us about God through Jesus, that we now know God. We have the treasure of the knowledge of God in us. Mm. Why? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That God has placed the glorious Holy Spirit in you through the work of the gospel, the finished work of Christ on the cross, and the power of the resurrection, that you are alive unto God. You are a living spiritual being, and you're in human flesh, a, what he calls a clay pot, treasure. The treasure of heaven is in you. Man. Woo. God in us. However, Paul begins to go through some verses at, at the end of the fourth chapter. He says, you know, I, I've been knocked down. Knocked around, but not knocked out. I've been perplexed, but I'm not distressed. I've had trouble on every side. But the power of God, the treasure of God is in me. I keep 
moving forward. At the end of the fourth chapter, he puts it together in verse 16. He says, for which cause we faint not. We're not going to quit. We're not going to stop. Why? But though the outward man perish, we get weak. Every day we get weaker. Yet the inward man, the man with the gospel, the man with the glory of God, the Holy Spirit is renewed. He gets stronger and stronger every day. Amen? Oh, man, this, whoa, this will make you shout. Verse 17. For our light affliction. Oh, thank God there's a time on it, Mark, which is but for a moment. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory that all of us moving here and moving there with its treasure in us, all the affliction, us being stricken in this life, God is performing his work through us as we tell his story and we give him the glory. But it's only going to be for a moment. There's a limit on it. Praise God. He kind of summarizes this in verse 18. I love this. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. He says, God, because of the gospel and the Holy Spirit, and we've been called, now we have the eyes of faith. We're able to see beyond the horizon. And we see God has a mighty army to protect us. We, we, we see the presence of God. We, we see the promises of God. We understand God's in control. That's what God does. Man. Now what, what Paul does, he goes into the fifth chapter and says, oh man, here we go. But there he uses a different analogy. He uses the analogy of a tent, a tabernacle. And anybody that knows anything about camping and tents, tabernacle, they're all meant to be temporary. Amen? He begins to talk about that, that we live in these tents and they draw. They're, they're dissolving all around us and... and some of us who are over 30, we understand that. Man. We, we, we don't move as, as quick as we used to move. When we move, things pop and all kind of stuff. But every day we grow weaker and we groan and we, and we desire one day to be absent from this body. To leave the pain, to leave the struggle, and to see our Savior face to face. And he says that to be absent from this body, then we'll be with the Lord. And he tells us a powerful thing in verse number 12 after he goes through that analogy. He says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Man. What happens to Paul here, and, and, and th this is what really made me excited, is that if Paul says, whoa, I'm going to exercise my faith, and he quits going through that stuff, and Paul begins to say, let me tell you what, why I'm so motivated. Rather than talking about the struggles, Paul says, let me tell you what motivates me, why I get up every day and do what I do. He begins, and, and he tells us, and Verse number 13, he says, For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. And whether we be sober, it is for your cause. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13. 
You know what he's trying to say? He said, hey, he'd been accused of just being a fool for Jesus. He, you're just a fool, Paul. Paul said, you're right. I am a fool for Jesus. I am possessed by him. But when it comes to my ministry to you, I'm dead serious. I'm highly motivated because Jesus has consumed me. Because he changed me. The Holy Spirit lives inside of me. And I got something to say. You know, he goes on and, and he tells us that he is compelled. I'm just compelled to keep going. He, he says that this wonderful thing here in verse 14. He says, for the love of Christ constraineth me because we, we judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. If Jesus died, then everyone needs to hear. I'm motivated because of what Christ has done. And it's almost as if Paul was, was creating a music piece, you can hear the music begin to get louder. He says, I'm motivated because God loves me. I got something to say. I got to keep moving. I can't quit because I've got the light in me. The glory is in me. I, I, I got to get it out. Whoo. Then verse 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. <laughs> man, I love this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now what we normally do is yank that out. Well, you ought to be different, brother. And we don't read the next verse. The next verse is in there for a reason. Let's read verse 18. And all things that are new are of God. God created you. You're a new man, a new person, a new mission, a new purpose, and a new message to share. Who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Paul says, I'm motivated. I'm new. All this stuff in me is new. The Holy Spirit, the, 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 the new covenant, it's all new. I'm motivated. Then look what Paul says here in verse number 18. Woo! Verse 19, he says, to wit, or in summary, that God was in Christ. That's what happened. God came. The Son of God came. Amen? What did he do? Reconciling the world to himself. Bringing the world and making the world at peace where the world could have a relationship with him through Christ. How did he do it? By imputing their trespasses unto them. He took the sins of the world and he placed them on himself. Jesus did that. Well, how do we fit into this? And have committed or entrusted or has given to you as stewards the word. I want you to note that word is singular. There's only one message to give. The word of reconciliation. What should you be talking about? Jesus is the only way he can make you right. Woo, amen. He moves on and we're, just, we're about to the tip of the spear, okay. And he begins to draw this thing to a conclusion. And Paul says, let me just tell you what we are. This is a summation of that call that he started talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is a summation. He says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God entrusted, entreated, gave to us, we pray you in Christ did on his behalf, be ye reconciled to God. What Paul says, we have been called to be ambassadors. 
Amen? Uh, we kind of hear a little bit about that in the news. Ambassador to England, ambassador here. You know. But in that day, it was very special. The ambassador belongs to the one who sends them out. Amen? If you're saved, if you are, you've been sent out. And you've been called an ambassador. Because within you is the treasure of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that God wants to get out of you by your actions and by your words. The ambassador is commissioned to be sent out. He exists only for the purpose which he is sent. In the ancient days, man, they would place a letter in a, in a pouch and, 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 and put a seal on it, the seal of the king, and that, that messenger, that ambassador would go to that far land and on the behalf of that king he says, this is what the king is declaring. We're in a foreign land. We've been commissioned by the high king of heaven, Jesus. And we are to tell his story. Well, what's the message? The ambassador is sent forth with the message of the sender. Well, <laughs> just in case we didn't get it. Paul gives it to us. It's verse 21, guys. It's right there in the Bible. For he has made him, Jesus, to be sent for us. God sent the Holy Son of God to become sin for you and for me. And he knew no sin. Why did he do it? That you and I would be right before God. That's what we ought to be talking about. Let me tell you about a man I met at a place called Calvary. Woo! I met him there, and I realized he loved me. He died for me, and he has changed my life. That man was God. He took my sins. He paid the price for my sins. And based on what he has done for me and based on his word, he will do the same thing for you. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's pray, guys. Father, we love you so much. Lord, I thank you for this word that is so powerful. Whew. All we got to do is read it. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, I pray whatever you do in our hearts tonight would be done by you. Lord, I have not come here with any agenda other than sharing what you've laid on my heart, God. And, and I have wrestled. You know I've wrestled. I've spent some time, you and myself, God, dealing with this stuff. Not wanting to, to do it all, but you wouldn't allow that, God. And, and I believe it's been received well tonight. By the Spirit. Lord, I, I pray, Lord, let us look and ask the question, are we where we ought to be? Is Jesus on the tip of our tongue because he's in our heart? Now, Lord, you work and you do what you're going to do, God. And, Father, let us stay out of the way. Let us just stay out of the way. Let us give you glory and elevate the gospel. We ask this in Christ's name. Pastor.